newcomer Yoshimitsu Bano, a TV director and former assistant director for Akira Kurosawa, was brought on to helm Godzilla's new adventure facing off against an original foe, Hedra, aka the Smog Monster, in Yoshimitsu Bano's 1971 film Godzilla vs. Hedra. Hey everyone, welcome back to Chills and Thrills. My name is Connor Dunham and I am here with Chris once again. Uh, Chris, how you doing today? Doing just fine, sir. All right, always glad to hear it and always glad to be doing a Godzilla movie with you. Yeah, I feel like this episode is going to be dirty and polluted and slimy and gross. Hey, that's all right. That is all right. Today we are doing Godzilla vs. Hedra, or in the American title, Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. And this is a 1971 uh, Japanese kaiju film directed by Yoshimitsu Bano uh, with special effects by Terayoshi Nakano, uh, produced and distributed by Toho. It's the 11th film in the Godzilla franchise and features the fictional monsters Godzilla and Hedra, or Hedora, however you prefer to pronounce that. Um, the film stars Akira Yamachi, Toshi Kimura, and Hiroyuki Kawasi, and features Hiro Nakajima as Godzilla once again, and Kenpachiro Satsuma as Hedra. Now, I uh, I actually really like this one, and on the, re- the rewatch, I I had a lot of fun with this one. It's... Uh, it's 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 goofy and uh, there's a lot of Godzilla in it. There's a lot of Hedra in it, and I just think that this film, for the Showa era, from especially from the film we're coming from, which is All Monsters Attack, is uh, a much more fun time. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. You know, Godzilla the franchise gets such a rap for being generic and and they're all the same, but there's all of these entries where they're shockingly unique and we're, we're coming off of a, uh, you know, say what you want good or bad about all monsters attack. It's certainly a a unique entry in the series. And and in this one, in another way, it's an incredibly unique entry in the series. And uh, while it might be a scenario where the whole is maybe, less than the sum of the parts, you know, maybe, maybe the overall movie I, I I don't love or I'm not over the moon about, but there are a lot of aspects and parts and pieces of this movie that are really, really interesting, unique, uh, well done, cool to look at, cool concepts. And, And so the, the total package might not kind of gel, but there's a lot going on in this movie that that that, that you can appreciate, and uh, I, and I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Um, one of the things um, I found or also noticed, I already knew about this film, was uh, it features an environmentalist message. Um, with the what I found uh, quoted was with the malevolent Hedra being spawned from pollution. So uh, it, I like that it gives the message, especially way back in the early 70s, that, you know, we need to we need to start taking care of our home. You know, we, let's try to stop pollution. And that's continued all the way up until this very second today. Yeah. And, and from what I understand at this time in particular, because there's also a, a Gamera movie that came out this same year that dealt with with a pollution kind of theme or, or around this time, 71, 72. And so I think in particular in Japan around this time is there was a lot of attention on this, like, you know, the, the fish life getting, getting killed or impacted by, by pollution and, and the waters, you know, 
being impacted. Like I, I believe in particular for Japan at this moment, this was a very, you know, hot button topic. And, uh, I do like that it that it's got an uh, a message, an environmentalist message, a, an anti pollution message, just because it gives the movie. You know, probably since the first movie, this is probably the most you know uh, thematically charged movie in terms of in terms of trying to have a sort of statement of the time about issues of the time, and uh, and, and I and I like that, and and uh, I think that. In terms of the the direction of the movie, some of the other Godzilla movies can sometimes feel a little uh, generic. Nothing against some of the other directors, not necessarily Ishiro Honda's films. He's got a style. John Fukuda kind of sometimes doesn't really seem to have too much of a style, but but when you see this movie and you know that it was directed by Yoshimitsu Bano, you can see in the movie with the editing and the visual choices and a lot of the stylistic things that he definitely was. He had there's a lot of creativity in his mind and whether or not he got it all on screen in the most effective way. He was, he was going, this movie takes a lot of big swings stylistically and you can see that he's just trying to put something on the screen that's, that's unique and, and unusual and weird. And, and again, you know, it might, maybe doesn't work so well, but you can, but this has a, this has a directorial flair to it that a lot of the Godzilla movies don't. And I think that's worth appreciating. Yeah, it has, you know, they set out to make something with a message and I guess it's for the viewer to kind of decide um, because, you know, everyone's opinion is going to be different as in if they succeeded in kind of delivering that message or not. But I like some of like the little odds and ends, you know, in the some of the quotes in the movie where they're like, you know, about the pollution, you know, Godzilla is going to be upset or that's not the exact quote, but... Mm-hmm. It's just that uh you know I'm a I'm a big sucker. I uh I see like, you know, the animals with like the six pack, the plastic uh six pack thing around a turtle's neck or something like that and it's like damn, that sucks, you know, that's sad and stuff, you know, that and that's today and there's a lot more regulations yeah. today so what were they doing 40 years ago you know absolutely the footage of of just the uh the the huge you know i i'm the you know i'm no i'm no hippie crazy environmentalist sob story bleeding heart type of individual but but there are real problems that that the world is facing it and maybe not so much now as at that time you know maybe in some ways worse maybe in some ways better but but yeah, you see the footage of just the gunk and the goop like sliding across the surface of the ocean, and it's hard not to be like, yeah, we're kind of, you know, things are things are getting rough. And and I'm the same way when when I see like a turtle, the video of the turtle getting like a plastic straw removed from its nose that was lodged up its nose. It's like that, like that's gut wrenching to me to see. You know, I I feel bad for animals. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm a I'm an animal lover, so uh, any type of that stuff is uh, it's it's pulling on the heartstrings. But uh, before I get uh, too emotional down that path or get to start making listeners or anybody sad, um, <laughs> Godzilla vs. Hedra, um, the film was released theatrically in Japan on July 24th, 1971, and it received a theatrical release in the United States under the title... Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster in July 1972 uh, by American International Pictures. Uh, it was released as a double feature with the American film The Death Master, which I have never seen or heard of. But uh, it's it's nice to know that this one, uh, they went back to a theatrical release for this one. Yeah, yeah, that, that's always nice. You know, these movies were, for a long time, staples of, of American drive-in cinema and so you know sometimes once a franchise starts to get deemed like at the tv level the straight to tv level you know especially these imported franchises from overseas it's hard to then get back out of that and be deemed sort of worthy of a theatrical presentation so i'm happy that i'm always happy to hear when any godzilla movie was given that treatment absolutely well uh 
I think what I'll do is, uh, again, we'll get right into the trailer. We'll uh, give a plot synopsis on the film, and then we'll come back with some numbers, fun facts, and get into uh, other sorts of what we liked and uh, didn't like so much about the film. Sounds good. Microscopic alien life form Hetera feeds on Earth's pollution and grows into a poisonous, acid secreting sea monster. After he sinks an oil tanker and attacks Dr. Toru Yano and his young son Ken Yano, scarring the doctor, Hetera's toxic existence is revealed to the public. Ken Yano has visions of Godzilla fighting the world's pollution and insists Godzilla will come to humankind's aid against Hetera. Hetera metamorphoses into an amphibious form, allowing him to move onto land to feed on additional sources of pollution. Hetera, having emerged at a power station to consume pollutant gases from the smokestacks, is confronted by Godzilla. Hetera is easily overpowered by Godzilla and retreats into the sea. During the fight, however, several pieces of his new body are flung nearby which then crawl back into the sea to grow anew and allow the monster to become even more powerful. He returns shortly thereafter in a flying saucer-like shape, then assuming his strongest form of all, his perfect form, which demonstrates some of the strongest powers he has access to yet. Thousands of people die in Hetera's raid, and even Godzilla is unable to defend against Hetera's poisonous emissions. As hope sinks, a party is thrown on Mount Fuji to celebrate one last day of life before Japan, and then the rest of the world, succumbs to Hetera. Ken Yano, Yukio Kuchi, Miki Fujinayima, and the other partygoers realize that Godzilla and Hetera have come to Mount Fuji as well for a decisive confrontation. During the battle, Godzilla fights valiantly against Hetera, but is overpowered by the amorphous alien. Losing an eye and having his hand burnt to the bone by Hetera's acidic body tissues, which corrodes anything it comes into contact with. Finally, Godzilla is almost killed by Hetera after Hetera hurls Godzilla into a giant pit, then proceeds to attempt to drown Godzilla in deluge of chemical sludge. Dr. Teru Yano and his wife Toshi Yano have determined that tr- drying out Hetera's body may destroy the otherwise unkillable monster. While Godzilla and Hetera fought, the JSDF swiftly constructed two gigantic electrodes for this purpose and attempted to fire them, giving Godzilla the chance to return to the fight. 
All of a sudden, the electrodes short out. The power cut off by Godzilla and Hedra's violent battle. Godzilla reactivates and energizes the electrodes with his atomic heat ray, dehydrating Hedra's outer body. Hedra sheds this outer body and takes flight to escape, but Godzilla propels himself through the air with his atomic heat ray to give chase. Godzilla drags Hedra back to the electrodes and continues to dehydrate him until Hedra is on the brink of defeat. Godzilla tears open Hedra's dried out body and exposes it to the electrodes again, dehydrating the pieces until nothing remains but dust. Godzilla returns to the sea, but not before pausing to gaze sternly at the surviving humans. Ken Yano bids goodbye to Godzilla. All right. On Rotten Tomatoes, uh, this film has an approval rating of 62% with an average rating of 5.3 out of 10. Um, it has a 6 out of 10 on IMDb, and 91% of Google users liked this film. Uh, Godzilla's on screen for 20 minutes and 33 seconds, or 24% of the film, so pretty much doubling almost every other film. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that's that's an interesting statistic, you know, because in in some regards, you know, when you consider that, I think among most fans, they don't rate this film terribly high. And so it kind of goes against that grain of all Godzilla fans want is just to see Godzilla on screen. And the best movies are the ones that has Godzilla on screen the most. It's like this sort of flies right into the face of that and shows that even when there's a ton of Godzilla screen time, there are still a lot of things that can make a make a fan enjoy or not enjoy the movie. So that's an interesting statistic for me. Yeah, because the first one, the original Godzilla is what, 96 minutes long, I believe. And I, I believe I, when I looked it up, he was on film or on screen for just over eight minutes. And I believe this one's roughly like 88, 89 minutes. And for him to be on screen for 12 more minutes, you know, 20, almost a little over 20 and a half minutes, that's that's a substantial increase compared to yeah. every other film in this franchise so far. Yeah, and, and especially it would be substantial if it was a Godzilla solo movie, let alone being a movie where he shares screen time with a whole other monster. And yeah, and I noticed like once you hit kind of the hour mark, you're kind of in the final battle between Godzilla and Hedorah, and you ride that out almost all the way through the 85, 86-minute full runtime of the movie, which is, is interesting. Yeah, it uh, it comes out to... He has a full appearance at 22 minutes and 40 seconds, or 27% of the way into the film, and we get a tease of him. I believe it's uh, him walking across the sunset at 12 minutes and seven seconds or 14% of the way into the film. Which, and, uh, which the is initial a attempt, shot, by the way, that's, a yeah, absolutely. Um, this was, uh, one of the ones I seen when we went to G fest and when he showed oh. up at that moment, the, of course the crowd went crazy. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's, you know, as we break down into more of the categories, you know, we'll we'll talk all about the pros and cons of the movie. But that is a that's a great shot. That's a memorable shot in the film. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it definitely stands out in this film, uh, considering most of the film is a dark, like you said, sludgy film. And then you have this gorgeous array of colors in a sunset with Godzilla walking across the screen. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I got one more number for you, and that is the initial attendance of this film uh, was 1.74 million. So, uh, still not great, not you know, it, uh, but uh, we're still making enough money to keep going, keep chugging away. Yeah, yeah, that's you know. They were, as the attendance sort of declined, they kind of modulated the budgets down. And from what I understand, according to the director of this film, he had about half as much, uh, he had about half as much, uh, the budget was about half as much as some of the recent films. And he, he had about 35 days to shoot the entire thing. And, and unlike other movies, which had, a production crew for the the human drama and a separate special effects crew 
for the monster action, this was all one unit, all one crew. So he had 35 days to do it all with a single team. So, you know, some of the shortcomings or clunkiness of the movie might be due to some of the strained aspects of the production. Yeah, and for 35 days, you know, uh, I I honestly think this is a good film. I wouldn't <laughs> go yeah. as well as saying it's super high, but, I mean, it's enjoyable, you know? Yeah, the, the, the thing I like to say on this movie is that it, it feels, when you watch it, it feels like it's maybe, like, one more editing pass or one more writing pass, but maybe, you know, working with what they have. It's maybe, like, one more good editing room pass from being potentially a really, really good movie. It kind of doesn't really come together effectively. You know, it's an, it's like 85, 86 minutes. It feels, to me, a lot longer than that. And uh, so, like, it's kind of paced kind of awkwardly, but... But I always, it's it just it's like a few degrees off from like there's a really really good movie in here. It's just a few of the pieces didn't quite come together the right way. But there's still a lot to love about it. Yeah, for sure. And um, so I know uh, you have a tendency of watching some uh, some weeks or in the past the dubbed version and the subbed version. Um, did you do that this week or was it which uh, one did you watch this week? No, this one I this one I only this one I only went subbed because uh, the the dubbed version is kind of, you know I have the Criterion set which only has it subbed and and so the dubbed version is a little harder to come by these days and uh, so I only watched the subbed version this time. Okay, I was just curious because I know uh, in some episodes we've done like a a little cut comparison of the music or. Um, some of the different yeah. lines that change. So I, I didn't know if you had any of well, that for us. Uh, I, I do have a little bit because an interesting thing about this movie is that it kind of has, in a sense, sort of two different edits, but almost three different ways to watch the movie. Not all of them are readily available. So the original Japanese cut does have an English dub that was that's called the international dub, which is the dub that Toho paid for from from kind of a Hong Kong company to kind of just dub the movie into English, and it's the same exact movie, but with their English language dub. And like for example, if you'd gotten the Blu-ray of the movie, I think from recent years, I think it was from like Kraken releasing or something, it has that dub on it, the international dub. And there is an alternate U.S. cut that is. That is the version titled Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, and it has an alternate dub that most consider to be of a higher quality, and it has a few edits to the film. It's nothing dramatic. From what I understand, it's it's things like replacing the Japanese opening song with an, e- with an English opening song, and uh, things like... Uh, um, Hmm. So just certain, uh, like some of the um, the visuals, I think that I think they they maybe edit out some of the little animated sequences or or do different things with the text over over some of those sequences. It's nothing. It's nothing very dramatic, but but it's just some a a, a better dub, a a different title, a different sort of main theme song at the start of the movie. Okay, I uh, I just I figured I'd reach out and ask that because I uh, I have the DVD from way back when I got it on Amazon that has okay. the Japanese with the subtitles and then also the English dub that it has the title. You know, um, let me that says. When the ultimate power of green takes on the menace of unclean, it's Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. And then at the bottom, it says Godzilla vs. Hedera. So okay, it's, yeah, uh, that's, th- yeah, that that label was, uh, was Kraken releasing. And so that's the Japanese cut of the movie, just with the, the... That one includes the English dub. And I think there's some kind of weird licensing thing where when Criterion got, got it for their set... They got the original Japanese cut, but but they didn't get Kraken releasing. Still had some kind of licensing window on that international dub, 
So that's why the the Kraken or the Criterion Blu-ray only has the Japanese audio. But those are those are both the original cut of the movie. They're both the the theatrical cut of the movie. And I think from from what I understand, what I saw, that Blu-ray, the Kraken release Blu-ray, actually has a better quality uh, print of the movie visually than the one that Criterion has. Yeah, I always uh, thought that this uh, case was funny. Um, on it, it says, uh, Hedra wants to snuff the planet with sludge and toxic gas, but first he's got to fight Godzilla, who will kick his smoggy mass. Yeah, it, yeah, they, they went very, uh, they sort of went really kind of like a B-movie, you know, matinee, Drive-in theater kind of fun with the with the slogans and the and the uh, the taglines for for those releases. I used to have them, but of course, when the Criterion set came out, I was like, "Oh, I don't need two copies of these movies," and I sold them off. But I probably should have kept them. That was my first thought. I uh, I just kept the DVDs just uh, just as like a little keepsake, you know, almost like a collector's item because uh, eventually, I'm sure they won't be around. Yeah, well, and 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 the unfortunate thing is that I think. I think for for Ebra Horror of the Deep, uh, Godzilla vs. Hedorah, and Godzilla vs. Gigan, those were three that were released by that label, Kraken. So those are three that have English dubs that on the Criterion set are are Japanese only because that company uh, had, you know, whatever deal they'd made to release those movies, those English dubs are on those discs, but, but... the rights hadn't lapsed or expired or, or whatever, and so Criterion wasn't able to use the those English dubs for for this box set. Maybe one day Criterion will do some kind of upgrade or something, and, and they'll have access to everything. But but the sad thing is is that the loss of the sort of the unique U.S. edits, you know, the Godzilla versus the Smog Monster version that has the English language opening song, you know, Save the Earth and all that. Like those versions are the ones that are like borderline completely lost i don't know if they'll ever get sorted out and released on disc again but those are the real those are the real artifacts yeah and uh i'm happy to say i have all three of those from the kraken uh release sitting on the movie shelf yeah hold on to those because i believe a number of them are out of print at this point and for some of these films that's the only way to watch them with an english dub so i like i said i had them and then i ditched them and i should have held on to them I uh, did that with my old VHS copies. You know, I see a bunch of people in the in the group posting them, and I'm like, God, I wish I would have kept them because you know some of the cover art was so cool back then. Yep, I held on to the VHSs for a long time, and then eventually I was just like, you know, it was just taking up space. I'm like, this is just pure nostalgia. I don't own a VCR, but they were cool shelf items, and I've considered going to eBay and trying to get up, grab up all of the VHSs the versions that I had, but, you know, never got around to that. Yeah, and plus you're probably going to pay $100 for each one or more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are surprisingly some really good deals. People don't really put a lot of value on them, so it's easier to get multiples together than you might think, but to get them all would be more of a tedious thing, I think, than necessarily the most expensive thing in the world, depending on the ones you're going after. For sure. It'd be a... Uh... It'd be fun to track them all down and have them on the shelf again, because uh, I do like the uh, the voodoo and the movies anywhere. So, like, if I buy a Blu-ray and digital film, I, I just put it on my voodoo account. But I've always been that person that likes to have the physical media copy on a movie shelf somewhere. Just, I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. So when people come over, they're like, damn, you got all these movies? Like, hell yeah, I do. <laughs> I 100%. I'm absolutely a physical over digital kind of a guy. I'll buy the 4K disc. I'll buy the Blu-ray disc. And I will I will just put the digital code in an envelope somewhere. I do not care about it. Like, put it on a disc for me, you know. It's convenient to be able to have the digital copy, but I'm one of those purists that, you know, physical media for life, you know. Yeah, a lot of the physical or the digital copies, I'll... Uh, I'll put them in the the voodoo or movies anywhere, and that way, because uh, my lady and I, we go to a lot of softball tournaments out of town, and so, you know, we go to a hotel, and uh, we can watch, you know, any of those movies on my phone or, you know, 
if the TV in the hotel is a smart TV, you can watch it on there. So we do it for that, but I, I always for sure keep the physical media. Yeah. All righty. Uh, what's our, what's our first breakdown category for the film? Um, I have, we can go into a, our character score quote, um, or, or we can do fun facts. I'll, I'll go dealer's choice for you. Oh, we haven't gotten into fun facts yet. Uh, we have not. Okay, let's, let's, let's go, let's roll right into the fun facts. All right, we can do that. This is what I found. Um, the hetera suit actor Satsuma, uh, would go on to portray Godzilla in later films. Um, I did not find out, uh, which films, but I'm sure Ooh, doing the research that, here soon, I will find out. That, that's interesting. I have that, that, that was a little bit of a fun fact that I actually came across myself. So that, that suit actor actually is the Godzilla suit actor for the entire Heisei series from 1984 to 1995, which is a lot of people's favorite series. That, that's the guy who became the Godzilla suit actor, Satsuma. And, uh, you know, so it adds some significance to this movie in the franchise. This was his first time portraying a Toho monster, and then he goes on to be the main Godzilla suit actor for one of the main uh, series in the franchise. Yeah, that's great. I'm I'm glad you had that on hand because I did not. So uh, you're picking up what I'm putting down. I like it. 100%. All right. Um, director Bono initially conceived the idea for Godzilla vs. Hedra after seeing cities like Yokechi or Yokachi covered in black smog and the ocean filled with foam from dumped detergent and formulated the story of an alien tadpole transforming into a monster as a result of the, as a result of the pollution. That's interesting. Uh, while we're on the note of the director Yoshimitsu Bono, I'd like to throw out that in a roundabout kind of way, he is the reason that we got the modern MonsterVerse movies. I don't know if you know the details of that story. Um, I believe I have that in my last fact I'm going to give you, unless you want to go ahead right now. No, we, we can save it. We'll save it. We'll get to it. Okay, awesome. I will, I'll get to that here in a few. This one kind of goes off what you said earlier. Um, Bono was only given 35 days to shoot the film and only had one team available to shoot both the drama and monster effect scenes. And then, uh, veteran Godzilla director Ishiro Honda was later tasked by producer Tomoyuki Tanaka to watch Bano's rough cut and provide advice. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, this is one of those situations where you could kind of imagine that if Bono had only been the writer on this film and if someone like Honda had directed it, you know, with the film having more of this uh, social commentary and environmentalist sort of theme and allegory, you could imagine a director like Ishiro Honda sort of having a field day with it and and that going hand in hand with his extensive Godzilla experience. You could have you could imagine a movie like this where it was written by Bono and directed by Honda, and you could have gotten you know this thing could have been potentially a masterpiece in that scenario. Yeah, I feel like it would have been a very dark and hard hitting masterpiece. Not as good as the first one, but probably uh, like hard hitting like that, where it just punches you right in the gut. Yeah, it's, might have had a little bit less of the of some of the psychedelic flares to it that didn't seem to be Honda's, uh, you know, style. But it certainly, in some of the, the, the darker themes of it, of just this pollution killing everything, you know, I've seen some people compare this movie to being a, a borderline apocalyptic movie. And it's like, you don't really get that vibe from the movie, but there are certainly threads of the movie that seem to that seem to go along along those lines, you know, the kids on the mountain that sort of, you know, they think they're all doomed, so they're just going to, like, party out their last days. You know, there's elements of that sort of doomsday type of movie in it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you got you get some dead bodies, some skeletons and stuff. So there's, there's like, some horror aspects in this, but um, it, it's nowhere close to, you know, seeing the scenes of 
people in the hospitals suffering and whatnot from the original film. Yeah, it, it's portrayed a little bit less, uh, you know, a little bit less, I don't know the word for it, a little less dramatically, a little less uh, dour, I suppose. All right, I'll go into the next one here before we get, again, too dark and too sad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ken Pachira Satsuma, um, again, the actor who played Hedra, was struck with appendicitis shortly after production, and he was given a publicity interview to a newspaper while loosely wearing the heavy Hedra costume, and uh, he had to be rushed off to surgery. During the appendectomy, Satsuma learned that painkillers had no effect on him, so he was uh, <laughs> pretty much having surgery in the Hedra suit. <laughs> First of all... I, I love everything about that story. Like, I love that he was giving an interview while in the suit because that seems exactly like the kind of thing that would have happened in, you know, vintage cinema, you know, the giving the interview in the monster suit. I think it's insane that they had to do the appendectomy while he was wearing the suit. And then for the story to be worded that way that he learned, you know, on the fly that painkillers had no effect on him. It's like, talk about having a rough day and a rough go of it. That is just a great story. Yeah, he's uh, he's not catching a break at all. He's in this, I don't know exactly the weight, but it was probably somewhere between 50 and 100 pound suit, if not more. And... You know, you got to have surgery and then, oh, all right, well, this feels terrible. All right, we got some painkillers for you. Three hours later, it's like, oh, well, can I have some more? These ones didn't work. Yeah, it's not it's not working. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, director Yoshimitsu Bano, uh, he was going to make a sequel to this film, uh, but it was scrapped due to the fact that Tomoyuki Tanaka reportedly hated this film, uh, so he fired Bono from uh, any possible future Godzilla films. Yeah, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a you know you hear sometimes that there's reports that are maybe exaggerated on both ends. You know, there's reports that that he that Tanaka was was in the hospital for a portion of the filmmaking, and and that when he saw it, he kind of declared like you've killed the brand or you've killed Godzilla or you've killed the franchise or something. And, and so that's why the next Godzilla movie, you know, we'll get to that when we get to it, but sort of the next Godzilla movie is like viciously traditional in terms of a Godzilla movie. You know, it gets a little bit more production value, uh, is very sort of classical monster mash kind of a movie, like very old school in that way, because I think there was a fear that, you know, this movie's a little, it's a little art house, as they say, you know, it's a little avant-garde, it's, it's got the psychedelic aspect, it's got this, this message, it's got this, you know, it uses this really strong, interesting, like, imagery and the juxtaposition of the editing, you know, you go from, like, a clock covered in sludge and then, like, a hard cut to, like, beautiful flowers, you know, it's like, it's got a lot of interesting editorial choices and, and like montage and they're, they're cutting to interviews and montages on the TV with the citizens and, and, and just a lot of interesting things like that. And so it's very off model for a Godzilla movie. It's very sort of like off style and off brand. So I can see how there'd be a, a hesitancy to, to really like jut back in the other direction and, and make something very sort of give us a normal Godzilla movie. Cause this was weird, you know? Yeah, they they took a chance on this one, and like I said, it's a uh, it's up to the viewer to the, to decide, you know, if they like it or not, or if they feel like they succeeded with the view they took and the message they were trying to get across to everyone. Absolutely. So this is the last one, and this goes off a little bit of what you were saying earlier. Uh, Bono spent several years trying to acquire funding for a 40-minute IMAX 3D Godzilla film starring a new version of Hedera called Deathla. The project was tentatively called uh, Godzilla 3D to the Max, and the project was eventually scrapped, but several members of the production team, including Bono, would work on the 2014 Godzilla in November 2013, uh, Bono stated that he still hoped to make a sequel to Godzilla vs. Hedra, but died uh, in 2017. And he also served as an executive producer 
on Godzilla King of the Monsters from 2019 and Godzilla vs. Kong 2021, which uh, both were released after his death. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting story. I remember being a kid following, you know, when Godzilla, I remember I was following a movie website, a Godzilla movie website. I think it was called like MonsterZeroNews.com or something to that effect, something very Godzilla. And I would follow updates on Godzilla Final Wars like crazy. I would go to this website every day. And I remember after Final Wars came out, you know, at that time it was, you know, packaged and promoted as the last Godzilla movie or certainly the last one for a very long time and then I remember immediately Yoshimitsu Bono was talking about you know there were these articles about oh I've got permission from Toho to to do an IMAX movie and this and that and I'm going to direct it and I was like very interested and then then like the information came out about it being like a 40 minute 3D IMAX movie and I remember just going everywhere on the internet and like being paranoid be like is this going to be released on DVD one day? Will I be able to buy it on DVD? Do I have to do I have to go to an IMAX theater to watch this because at that time there weren't very many IMAX theaters in the world and those movies didn't really there were a lot of documentaries and IMAX movies didn't really get released on DVD. So I was like paranoid that there was going to be this 3D Godzilla movie for IMAX and that uh I was never going to be able to like buy it and own it. And I followed the production of that thing or the sort of would be production as like it was looking for financing and stuff. I remember the articles. I remember the interviews. And then, you know, in seeking financing is how they got in touch with Legendary, who then by sort of attaching themselves to that kind of production is how they kind of made the deal with Toho to be like, okay, we'll make a 3D movie, but this is going to be a 3D big budget American Hollywood movie. This isn't going to be some IMAX short film. And that is essentially how, how the monster verse was birthed. And, and while I'm not sure if Yoshimitsu Bono was like incredibly deeply involved with every aspect of the, of the creative, the creative elements of the monster verse, he certainly, you know, he's got the executive producer credit on the films and some of it was, was posthumous, but he certainly, you know, I believe he, he did have, you know, there was contact with the production. He wasn't, it, it's not an in-name only kind of a thing. It's not a totally hands-on kind of a thing. But I always love that, that in a roundabout way, he, he got back around into the Godzilla franchise after allegedly being banned from ever touching one ever again. I love that, that through, through his actions, you know, we, we, it helped create the monster verse that everyone seems to love so much. So, so I always liked that as a nice little ending to, to Bono's journey with Godzilla. Yeah, it would have been, I, I would have loved to seen what he had as an original sequel to, uh, his film Godzilla vs. Hedera. Cause, uh, I just, I would like to see if he would have given it a more serious tone or if it would have been like back to like maybe a little more psychedelic or just the route he would have taken. Yeah, I, I, I know in the seventies, I believe the plot synopsis was sort of, uh, was that there was going to maybe be some stuff where it took place in Africa or was intended to take place in Africa and that there was going to be like, that it was going to be like a, a, you know, something very like related or connected to what was going on in Africa in the seventies. I'm I'm not really sure, but it was going to be this thing called a uh, Hitoda, which was going to be some kind of like, like H I T O D A H, like some kind of evolution, like starfish type of version of a Hedorah. And like all, all these interesting concepts and, and, and I remember there was a plot synopsis for the, for the 3D IMAX movie, the Godzilla 3D to the max that was, was gonna, like, there was gonna be a scene that took place at like the 9-11 memorial in New York with like Godzilla or something and that, and that it was gonna end up like going to, I think maybe like Niagara Falls or some kind of like Brazilian rainforest or something because there was, there was a plan to have Godzilla's tail go through a waterfall, like a huge waterfall and like, and like fling out over the audience, you know, in the big 3D way. So I remember reading that, like this plot synopsis and maybe it wasn't even true, but it, but it sounded very cool. And I liked the, I liked the concept of it. Yeah, I did see, uh, a little bit of that when I was, uh, reading up and doing research for this. 
Yeah, when I saw uh, when I saw Godzilla against Mechagodzilla at the Fathom events for its 20th anniversary, they showed the Godzilla versus Hedorah short film that they did for its 15th anniversary. You know, where Godzilla, I think both of them were the Final Wars costumes, just sort of revised and upgraded. And it was, you know, for a short film done with Suitmation, it was it was a it's a cool throwback to show that like, you know, modern day Suitmation, you know, even using suits that are 20 years old just being filmed in a bit more of a cinematic way with with different camera angles and a bit modern sort of pyrotechnics and lighting and stuff that you can still get, you know, some really cool images and sequences from from Suitmation. You know, it was great to see. Yeah, it's always it's always great to see that they can still uh bring those suits back and use them, you know, the ones that they've taken care of i mean they could probably use them today you know upgrade the paint you know and everything on them and they they could probably make a film just fine and have it look like just like the 80s 90s you know like no time has passed it would it would it would still work you know and it might work better than today's cgi if they were to do like an actual suit film today because of how much they could put into it if I won the lottery, I, I would I would fund a retro production just for the sake of it. I'd be like, give us like an eighty minute full blown suitmation, but like as good as you can make suitmation look, kind of a movie, just to see how how it would feel, how it would how how it would vibe, because I think it could be really cool. For sure. Um. Uh. That's all we have for fun facts. I'm gonna go right into. Uh, asking you who your favorite character was in this film. Gotcha. So uh, this is one where I, I'm not a huge fan of the of the human cast of the film, and I know it sort of it could arguably be. I mean, this is one of the movies where you could make a decent case for Godzilla being your favorite character because he's so characterized. But I won't do that. But I actually, you know. Like I said, it might be sacrilege, but like the little kid, Ken, you know, he he's sort of the, 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 the center of the movie in a lot of ways. And and he seems to have this sort of weird psychic connection to Godzilla and and everything going on. And, and he's sort of I don't know. I just that little kid. This is one of the few Godzilla movies where the little kid doesn't feel like it's a weird, annoying forced in aspect of the movie and it's like it's kind of done well in this movie i uh i can't say i disagree with you even though i guess i am gonna disagree with you and i'm gonna choose uh dr toro yano as my favorite character or ken's dad um for some reason i like the doctors in these films the scientists um how he comes up and he's uh looking at the hedra like the tadpole and he he takes a fragment and puts it in the water and he sees that it's still living so like every piece of hedra is like its own living thing almost like a you could see like john carpenter's the thing like taking inspiration from this or something because like every piece of it is its own living organism and it's gonna like fight fight to like protect itself 100 percent. when we get into sort of monster design and creature design i've i've got some 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 glowing things to say about hedora as a creature well uh do you want to well i'll go into my favorite score which uh was godzilla in flight when he's uh when he's chasing hedra down Yeah, if there's, you know, as much as there's there's things that I can say positively and negatively about the movie, I will say that I am the the big thing about this movie that I think really drags it for me personally is I'm a big kind of 
music and score guy, and I really, really am not a huge fan of the score of this movie. For me, like, the score might be one of the, like, biggest things weighing it down. It, it, it doesn't have a lot of energy. It kind of has this slow, plodding element to it. There's a lot of the movie that doesn't have music at all. And or it's that weird sort of cut in psychedelic trippy music and 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 it may and for me it makes the movie feel like it you know I think that's part of the reason the movie feel like it just drags because you just there's the the score is just like dead in this movie you know for for me personally so my favorite piece of music is actually the opening credits music the the Return the Sun music or for the English version they they changed it to Save the Earth but. But for me, that's like the most energetic and iconic piece of music from the movie because all of the main themes, they just, they, for whatever it is with my ears, like they just do not do it for me. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this soundtrack, so uh, I, I guess I kind of picked one that it was almost... Uh, Close to like you could say the original Godzilla theme, how it starts off and then it kind of tails off into its own thing. Once mm-hmm. Godzilla gets into flight and is chasing Hedra down mid flight, so uh, that was I listened to the soundtrack twice to uh, I've been doing that with a lot of these recently to uh, uh-huh. make sure I get the right one and just uh, listening to the soundtrack on its own. I, I always feel like um, it's just way different than listening to it while watching the film. So I guess technically I listen to it three times for each episode, you know, twice yeah. on Spotify and then once while I'm watching the film. And that's uh, that's just the one I landed on. Yeah, that's certainly the most, the most lively piece of music. And, you know, earlier I talked about how the movie feels kind of a few – key pieces away or a few steps removed from being like maybe going from a kind of middle of the road or or not so great Godzilla movie overall to being like a really good one. And I think that if you had someone like Akira Ifukube scoring this movie and you had the classic themes and the classic military march, the classic Godzilla theme, some of the classic monster battle music and things that if, if this movie was just like loaded with some of that, I feel like the entire tone and energy of the monster scenes at least would would shift completely, you know. I, you know, we talked about how there's earlier Godzilla movies where they did a lot of music replacement and score replacement, and and I would almost love to have seen this movie sort of be given that kind of American treatment where they maybe edit out five to ten minutes of the movie and maybe you know add in, maybe not necessarily replace, but maybe add in a bunch of additional pieces of music because this is one of those movies where I feel like the soundscape the music and the sound design is a little a little empty, a little a little dry, a little quiet and and it maybe could have used some 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 pumping up in that regard and, and maybe it could have could have helped make the movie, you know, have some more energy and flow better. Yeah, if you take that main title theme from Destroy All Monsters and throw it, you know, into the scene where Godzilla's blowing is atomic heat ray towards the ground to get ready to lift off to fly. If you put that right there, maybe it kicks it up a notch or something. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's any number of scenes where you could just imagine some of those, some of those nice Ifakube themes, just really giving it like more gravitas. Yeah. And this being like one of like the darker kind of like sadder films of the Showa era so far, you know, take some of those from the original 54. And when you're seeing all the sludge and stuff in the ocean, put those in there. And like you said, it would be a completely different film. 
or at least a different tone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll go into my favorite quote, and this was uh, also Dr. Toriano, and he says, If Hedra consumes our factory fumes and releases sulfuric acid mist, it won't clean our air. We will be smothered in toxic smog. And uh, I just, I like this one. That was uh, probably the hard hitting, hardest hitting line in the film and the most serious because it's, uh, he's pretty much just telling everybody like, if we can't stop him, you know, this, this could be the end for us and eventually every other country or nation in the world because there's pollution everywhere. So there's no telling, you know, what Hedra will become after Tokyo, if it goes to the United States, you know, our pollution is nowhere near any better. So he'll just continue to grow and eventually we'll be wiped out. Yeah. It's definitely one of those lines that kind of has those kind of apocalyptic doomsday kind of, uh, kind of a feel to it, you know, that that this movie kind of has, you know, it's, he's talking just about like, you know, a sort of extinction kind of event that, that Hedora could be. Uh, My uh, favorite lines of dialogue are actually uh, the, uh, the essay that, that, that young Ken gives where he says, you know, the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb cast their fallout into the sea Poison gas and sludge gets dumped into the ocean. And then he says, even sewage. And then he says that, uh, you know, let me get the line right here. I bet Godzilla would be mad if he saw this. You know, it's sort of, it, it, it's a little bit of a, of an encapsulation of the movie from, from the child's perspective. And, and the, the kid's perspective is a, is a big part of this movie, you know. He has kind of these visions of Godzilla when Godzilla's not really there. You know, he says things like like Godzilla's sending him psychic messages, you know. So it's got this whole kind of like kid perspective without being very kid-ish like all monsters attack. And, uh, you know, I, I like that, that that sort of through the through the lens of a kid that he's like, you know, that's how you would perceive Godzilla if you were a youngster. It's like... Godzilla is kind of ruling things, and if we muck up the oceans that he lives in, you know, he's going to get pissed off about it. And so I, I just like that. I like that aspect of it. Yeah, that uh, that's a great quote or line of dialogue as well. And uh, that's the one I was thinking of earlier when I'm like, yeah, he, you know, he's Godzilla is going to be mad when he sees this. So I'm glad that you chose that and kind of. Gave me a refresher on that one because uh, I, I do like that, you know. And you see, uh, he's kind of reading over his quote and uh, or his essay, and uh, you see Godzilla's head pop out of the ocean, and he starts lighting the pollution on fire. It's it's kind of a yeah. cool little mixed together scene. It's an in- yeah, it's an interesting sequence, and I, I like any dialogue that sort of casts Godzilla as a bit of a sort of like, you know wrathful and vengeful god type of figure you know like he's sort of you know uh, this sort of great creature and and you know not to not to ascribe like a religious value onto him but it's like it's sort of a, a of a wrathful god in sort of the old greek olympian kind of mythology way where it's like you know you anger him and he'll unleash the fury upon you kind of thing and i like any dialogue that kind of pits godzilla in a bit more of a mythological light and, uh, yeah, him, him setting the pollution on fire, you know, that's a metaphor for the movie since he fights a pollution monster. But this movie's loaded with a lot of kind of one-off scenes and, and vignettes of, like, these just – these concepts, you know, like the little animated cartoons of Hedora, you know, eating sludge and, and, and growing and mutating or, or you know, Godzilla setting the pollution on fire or the, the newscaster – uh sort of presentation on the different forms of Hedorah, you know. The movie has a lot of these, like, one-off interesting moments and scenes, you know. The character who see who's in the nightclub and he sees all of the people with fish heads, you know, sort of implying that, that just like all of the fish in the sea die from the pollution, you know, the humans are going to be no different, you know. We're all die from the pollution, too, you know. There's a lot of interesting things done in this movie. Even if it kind of 
sort of forms together in kind of like a weird, clunky, oddly paced, you know, weirdly scored movie. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things to chew on in it. Well, since we're uh, talking about scenes, and uh, you're on a roll, so uh, I'll ask what your favorite scene was in uh, this film. Oh, oh gosh, I man, it's one of those things where I wanna I wanna almost cop out and just say like the editing, you know, just like overall pl- praise, like the scene transitions and the editing and and some of the visual choices, you know, like I mentioned, like going from the clock covered in smudge to to the to and then a hard cut to like beautiful plants and you know. Or like the sort of uh, the newscaster editing and scene transitions and things like that, I'm a huge fan of. But as far as a favorite scene, it's gotta be it's gotta be like the huge long drag out grueling final battle between Godzilla and Hedora. You know, if you're a fan of monster action and kaiju action, and that's what you come for, and you want a big overblown final battle. Like this is a movie that certainly does not does not let you down in that regard. If if you're kind of the kid and you're just doing the whole like fast forward to the last twenty minutes and, and watch the monsters fight, this is a movie that will not disappoint you as far as giving you a big monster battle. So it's hard not to you can't you can't not pick that. Yep, and uh just as you said, you uh you can't not pick that. So uh that's my uh favorite scene as well, even though it's probably about five different scenes. It's 30 minutes yeah. of the movie. So <laughs> yeah, so the last 25 minutes of the movie is my favorite scene, but, but it is, you know, it, it, it's one of these things where it's like, it's a fight that feels, it is like a, like a grueling thing. It's like Godzilla is just like shoving his hands into him. And then like, you know, there's the scene where Hedorah is like basically like got Godzilla in a hole and he's basically like defecating on him and burying him in sludge and, and then they're trying to, to to fry it with the electricity, and then you know Godzilla like rips the the orbs out that are supposed to be like the eyeballs, and then it flies away, and then Godzilla has to fly after it, and like Godzilla flying is like peak ridiculous Godzilla, you know that's you know that's an odd moment, but like the fight is just so long, and and it's like this grueling experience, and everything's so dark and and grim and dirty and gross. And then there's like no music for most of that scene. And then when Godzilla kind of finally digs in and has completely killed Hedora, the, the triumphant, cheerful music jumps in. And it's like such a relief. Like it's finally over, you know? Yeah, I'm 100% on board with you with uh, Hedra shooting the laser out of his eye and like burning Godzilla's hand. And then like he's shooting. I don't know if you want to call them like little like sludge torpedoes and burns and messes up Godzilla's eye and then burns him, you know, he jumps and flies and then burns him, drops it like the sludge acid on his shoulder and starts burning his shoulder and it's almost like Godzilla's trying to run away from like the smoke bombs that he's pretty much throwing at him and like you said, it's a... Uh, it's definitely a, a grueling, long fight that he's just got to deal with, like, smoke and almost, like, toxic waste-type material. And it's, yeah. a, it's a good time when he gets him down, and finally he realizes that he has to just reach in and tear all the different sludge pieces of him apart, and he's throwing them everywhere. And then he finally takes one last couple blasts into the electrodes and just burns it all to a crisp to dust. Yeah, it's definitely uh it's definitely a, a you know, a dirty jobs episode, you know, guest starring Godzilla for sure, you know. Everything about it is just like gross and dirty and nasty, you know. Yeah, I'm Mike Rowe and uh yeah. this is my co host uh Godzilla and this is world's dirtiest jobs. <laughs> exactly. And and you mentioned the the laser out of the eyes. I, I love the glowing red eyes and and when it there's the scene where it's it's about to shoot the laser, sort of charging it up, the, where the head kind of like blooms in an interesting way with this red underneath it, and then it shoots the laser. And like I said, we're about to get into creature design, and I'm gonna go on forever. But like, there's a lot of really good monster moments, like creature feature moments in this movie. All right, well, we'll go right into creature design then, and uh, 
We'll uh, we'll talk about Godzilla first, since I feel like uh, we'll have a little bit less to say about him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is kind of the '70s Godzilla look. I think it's a it's a it's a pretty good look. You know, a little bit of that long neck frog head kind of a look, but it's not you know it's not the worst thing in the world. It's kind of of this era. You know, it's a it's a decent suit. You know, it's a little. A little less defined, a little more kind of a man in suit look to it, you know, but it's, you know, it's a solid design. Yeah, I like this look. If I was going to do like a tier ranking on them, this, um, it wouldn't quite be top of the pack, but I'd say it'd probably be mid to upper tier. Um, it's by far not the worst, but, uh, we uh, definitely have better to come, but like you said, this is like the basic 70s look that we're going to get for the next three, four films, and uh, I, I think it's a good look. I'm, I'm glad they stuck with it. i um, kind of curious if they wouldn't have what else they would have done uh, for it for the next couple films. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll get Chris on a ramble here. Uh, what did you think of the Hedra yeah. design? A lot to talk about yeah, with uh, my, the different yeah, here's, designs. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, my my three act sermon on uh, on Hedora, <laughs> like you know. But but honestly, it's sad because it's a design where the design itself is sort of ahead of its time. You know, it's it's trying to be this sort of blob creature with the sort of constantly like dripping sludge look. And unfortunately, the the final suit design ends up kind of looking kind of like a like a seaweed monster almost in its shape. You know, they're giving it this like drippy look, but because it's a physical suit, you know, it can't be a living, moving sludge suit. So so it has these limitations. So it has this like kind of haunted, kind of ghostly look to it. This sort of seaweed ghost kind of a look to it. So, but the concept itself is 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 amazing you know the the sort of sludge creature and it's the kind of thing that like you know you see a movie like like an animated movie like fern gully you know from the 90s and it's got like one of these like moving living sludge monsters and you can imagine what hedora could look like with with modern technology and modern effects but there's a ton of great effects work related to hedora in the movie you know even from the little moments of, of the sort of animated tadpoles in the, uh, in the Petri dish to the, the sea version of the creature that just kind of glides along the surface and the, the flying iteration of it that, that seems soft to touch, but it, but, it, but it's physically there. You know, there's just a lot of, I, I love that Hedora, I, I, I like transforming monsters and multi-stage monsters, so I like that Hedorah has multiple forms and evolutions, you know. I always kind of imagine that, that you know, whether it's Shin Godzilla or not, I always imagine that Godzilla is kind of a creature that kind of evolves and changes in between movies, and that's why does, the design's always different, you know. I just like that kind of, like, the creature evolves kind of uh, aspect, and so I like seeing a multi-stage creature like Hedora. And it's just like the the silhouette of it, the the look of it, the aesthetic of it is just like a really really good design, even better on paper, and and kind of ahead of its time, like beyond what they were technically capable of back then. Yeah, I uh, I have no problems with this design at all, from the supposed like tadpole form to almost like like you said, like a seaweed, like swamp monster type thing. And then to its flying form, I, uh, I love them all. And I'd love to see them get an entrance into the monster verse nowadays, even though it probably, probably won't happen because they want to come up with like their own ideas and like original monsters. But, uh, Hedra entering into the monster verse would be a phenomenal, I'm, I would, I'm sure it would be a good, a great design that they could come up with. Yeah, creatures like like Hedora and uh, and Biolanti, these sort of sort of non corporeal, not really like a traditional body type of creature. Like those are the kind that you can just imagine with digital effects and 
and things of that nature, just how interesting and unique they could be made. And, and something like Hedorah is also a monster that can kind of operate on a human level. You know, a big aspect of these movies is always wondering, you know, how do we get kind of the, the monster action kind of interacting and shrunk down to a size that's kind of allows the humans to be interact, you know, involved without just like looking up at the monsters. And so you can get a scenario where, you know, the Hedora like sludge pellets are, you know, like in this movie, they're flying through windows and the sludge is rolling down staircases. And so it just creates this like great opportunity for, to bring it down to that human scale while still keeping it as a, as a giant monster movie. And that's really, really, it's interesting. You know, I think it's right for a modern interpretation, but I agree that it, that it seems like it's probably unlikely. Well, once again, um, Toho and Legendary, we're, uh, we're talking to you. Get a deal done. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, out of the different forms of Hedra, did you have a favorite one or, and why uh, that was your favorite? Uh, I, hmm, that's a tough one. I actually, as much as I still like the final, the final stage form, the sort of seaweed droopy monster, I actually think that the, uh, the, the water form and the air forms are actually visually some of the most interesting. I especially like it when it's in the water and sort of just the eyes are coming up out of the water. Cause it kind of gives us like visual impression that it's like, you're seeing like just the top of a head of like a giant, like much more massive creature, but it's just like gliding, sliding, you know, aquatic sludge monster. And I don't know, it's just like the visual is just really captivating to me. And so I, I think it might be the sort of the, 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 the water and air forms of the creature might actually be my ones that are my favorite in terms of purely design. Yeah, I agree with you. It's almost uh, like the water. Um, you're only seeing the eyes. So, like, if you're one of the people in those ships that it attacked or if they saw it coming, you have no idea what that is and what you're in for. It's almost like, you know, seeing a shark fin in the water. You have no idea how large that shark is. You just know it's coming towards you. Exactly. And by the way, while we're on that note, the, the, the scene that, that's shown on a TV display of, of the aquatic version, the water version, sort of just ripping the ship in half, like that's a great scene. Like that's a great little like monster moment. You know, this movie has a ton of sort of just creature, creature action and like creature feature moments, you know, just the test tube stuff and the, and the kid, you know, holding his knife and sort of like slashing it down the middle and, and the sludge coming down the stairs and breaking through the windows and you see the bodies and the, and the kitten just like, you know, covered in sludge. And when it passes over the city and the smog is just sort of being dispersed everywhere. Like there's just a lot of great, like good old fashioned, like creature feature movie stuff going on in this, in this film. And I really dig it. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, the guys, uh, playing poker, uh, that get, I don't know if they, get like they're almost like drowned in the sludge um when it breaks through the window and then it like crawls its way back out the window after it's killed them uh that was another scene that i liked yeah which which again the the effect that they do to kind of have the sort of moving sludge puddle or moving sludge trail where it somehow looks wet and fluid but somehow has like a body to it that's moving around like i think that's an awesome effect like i just think it looks really really good it sort of like strikes that balance perfectly between looking kind of like fluid sludge but also still clearly being something that they were able to to move and operate and slide around like i think it's like a great bit of sort of monster design yeah, and I, uh, did you find anything on how they did that? I, uh, I did not. No, I, I, I you know, no, I, I, long story short, I did not. Okay, maybe I'll have to, uh, dig a little deeper and see if I can do a quick little 
60 second information on our next uh, episode about that. If I can find anything. Yeah. And if I had to have a theory, because it, it definitely looks like in some moments, like there's a sort of physical kind of slug for lack of a better word that they maybe are, are sliding around and moving. But I also wonder if in some scenes or moments, like maybe down the staircase and then it going back up the staircase, I wonder if there's maybe some reverse photography going on in there where they filmed it coming down the staircase, but then reverse the footage so it slides up. You know, maybe maybe there's some trickery like that going on. Like maybe there, because clearly in some scenes of the movie, there's there's physical sludge that is just kind of being flung and and filled in areas. So I wonder if it looks like maybe in some moments they paired that with a sort of with a sort of slug uh, design or physical slug thing that they could move around and then paired it with fluid. And maybe they did some reverse photography in moments and, and things of that nature. Yeah, they had the technology back then. So uh, like I said, I'll, uh, I'll take a little extra bit and try to see uh, if they did some reverse photography or see if I can find how they did that at all. But uh, it will take us right into our tier rating and see where you put, out of the 11 films we have so far, uh, Godzilla vs. Hedra, and what film we're getting rid of on this first week of saying bye to one of the Godzilla Showa films. Gotcha. Yeah, it's actually it's sad because as many, like I said, overall thoughts on this movie... There's a there's a lot of pieces and aspects of it that I feel stand out and I like a lot more than the flow of the overall movie. I think the overall total movie doesn't really come together in a way that I love or in a way that kind of puts it above most Godzilla movies. There's a lot to appreciate. There's a lot to like. And, and you know, and maybe in the editing room somewhere, there's like a really excellent version of this movie with a different musical score and maybe a different editing style that that would just be, you know, excellent. You know, the movie has some excellent things about it, but overall like it's an 85 minute movie that feels like a like a 2 hour sort of sludge fest for, you know, pardon the pun, but you know, it's a it's a dark visually movie. It's not got an energetic score. So so as much as I do like a lot of things about it, I'm not super positive on the movie overall. It's kind of a kind of a slog for me. So to get into my rankings because I'm, I'm saving, I'll go top to bottom to, to, to save the one that I'm cutting right now for last. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll still put Mothra versus Godzilla at the top. I'll put the original Godzilla as number two, still King Kong versus Godzilla. My number three, destroy all monsters. My number four, Ghidorah, my number five, son of Godzilla. My number six, uh, Astro monster. My number seven, uh, might be shocking, but Godzilla Raids again is my number eight. Godzilla vs. Hedorah is my number nine. Ever a Horror of the Deep is my number ten. And uh, All Monsters Attack is my number eleven that is uh, not making the cut. All right. So I'll do, the, I'll do the same to save it. I'll start from the top. Um, with uh, Mothra vs. Godzilla at number one. Invasion of Astro Monster at two. Number three, King Kong vs. Godzilla. The original, 1954, at number four. And then uh, sliding its way into number five is uh, Godzilla vs. Hedora. Number six, Son of Godzilla. Seven, Destroy All Monsters. Eight, Ebera Horror of the Deep. Nine, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. 10, Godzilla Raids Again, and surprise, surprise, number 11, the first one booted, uh, same as you, is uh, All Monsters Attack at number 11. Interesting, interesting. I'm, I'm glad you're ranking it a little higher because it, it's one of those movies where, and I feel like this is going to be true with a number of the movies, where it's like the ranking, you know, it's like these are 15 movies that I do generally pretty much really like them all. I mean, I'm a Godzilla fan, and, and I am a fan of, of, of all of them. So it stings to be like, oh yeah, this one's number nine out of 11 when it's like, oh man, it's like, it's, it's just that there are eight other ones that kind of give a little bit of a better time than this one, you know? So it, I, I, I'm glad to see that some of the ones I have ranked lower are a little higher on your, uh, on your list, getting a little bit more love because they deserve it. You know, just my personal preference. 
Yeah, I, there's a, there's quite a few that I like. And like we said before, our lists are going to be different. Um, especially for these first 15 films. Now, once we get to the Heisei and Millennium, you know, there's half as many films. So we might, uh, we might be a little closer on those ones and our lists might be a little more alike. So, uh, who knows? Excited to yeah. get to them, but, uh, it'll yeah, be one, a while. Yeah. yeah. Once you get to like a six or seven film series, there's a little less room for, for variance, you know, and, and I do like the idea of, you know, I love the idea of at the end doing an every movie counted, but I do like the idea that as we jump from one series to the next of kind of keeping it within that series while we're in that series, you know, to kind of set the precedent. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else that you can think of for, uh, Godzilla vs. Hedra? I, uh, I'm all out. That's all I got for you on this one. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I spilled my guts a little bit, you know. I, I you know, I, I never like to. I feel like sometimes I overcompensate that for the movies that I don't really love that much. I just try to really say all the things I do like because I do like a lot of things about this movie. But, but overall, like it's just you know, it's a hard one to get through for me. It, it it's a tone and a style that I don't love, but but I think it's really it, it's one of the most unique entries in the series, and not just for being a weird one. It it's it's directed and edited in a way that really stands apart from a lot of the other ones. There's a lot of non-traditional sort of uh, editorial things and visual things being done that, that someone can appreciate. So it's very easy for me to see how someone could, how this could be a love it or hate it kind of a movie where some people maybe rate it very, very highly for, for what it's going for. And especially with, with the allegory and the, and the message of the movie. And then some people are just like, Godzilla flies zero out of 10, you know, or what have you, you know, uh, that's an oddball moment that feels out of place in the movie, but you know, it's still an iconic moment and a memorable moment in and of itself. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not super hot on the overall movie, but there's a lot of things about the movie that, that I do like and admire. Yeah. Going into this, I didn't think I liked this film a lot, but I liked it on the rewatch more than I remember Again, like the Godzilla design, like all the Godzilla and Hedra action. Uh, the characters, uh, there's some scenes, you know, that are hit or miss with them, but overall, they're, they're pretty bland. They're basic Godzilla film characters. But, uh, I like this film, and, uh, I feel like, uh, what we've said about it, um, I like this. I like, uh, that we gave it some love. But then we also um, said what we didn't like about it. You know, we are honest about it. And, you know, that's that's what we want to do with all these films. We want to give people a, a different perspective, you know. If they have seen it, you know, uh, look at it through our eyes, you know, because me and you aren't going to have the same opinion on it on probably any of these films besides the first one. And uh, that's, you know, we love that first film. But uh, this yeah. one... Uh, it's part, it's part of the Godzilla lore. So, you know, we like it and we're going to continue to watch it until, we, you know, we can't know more. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes some of the sort of most oddball and weird Godzilla movies are the ones that you can have the most interesting of a discussion about and the most interesting analysis of, you know, the masterpieces that everyone loves, you know, Every every Joe on the corner can tell you what all of the greatest things about the classic and the and the and the iconic movies are. But you know, it's these sort of oddballs that it's like, you know, there's still there's still unique things about every Godzilla movie to appreciate. There's unique things that each one of them brought to the table. You know, if if Godzilla and Kong comes out and Godzilla finds himself in the gravity well in the hollow earth and uses his breath to propel himself in the inverted gravity, you know, that will Oh, tribute that will be that will owe its legacy to the flying Godzilla scene in this movie. You know, everything from every Godzilla movie can always be sort of repackaged and, and re-updated and turned into something really awesome somewhere down the road. So every Godzilla movie brings something to the table. Yeah, for sure. And you know, this is uh, like you said, some of the weirder ones are like the some of the films that aren't as good as the original. Um, are the ones we have a lot to talk about. 
there was there have been a couple of Godzilla podcasts that I've followed over the years, and, and they always want to, you know, you kind of start with the original, move on, and it's kind of always a shame because, you know, you're just starting out with the original. You don't really have your sea legs. You aren't really in your mode and your style. And so, you know, you do the original, and everyone's just like, this is great. I love it. It's awesome. It's so good. It's classic. It's iconic. And then they move on, and then, you know, by the time you get to the 10th, 11th, 12th episode, you're just getting these this great, you know, opinions and personalities of the people, and and really interesting perspectives on things. And then, you know, by comparison, the analysis on the original always feels a little bland. So, so I think there maybe needs to be a bit of a redux on the original movie, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, like you said, now we got our sea legs, you know, we're, uh, we're just sitting here rambling to each other. So, uh, it's, uh, we got a lot more comfortable and now, uh, we know what we're doing a little bit. Yeah, we're grinding. All right. I think that's all we got. Well, uh, Chris, thanks for joining me. Um, you know, here we go. One more week down, one more movie down. Um, Godzilla vs. Hedra was a fun one. Um, so thanks again for joining me on this one. Yep, always a pleasure. Um, Godzilla vs. Hedra was followed up with Godzilla vs. Gigan on March 12th, 1972. And we will be taking a look at that one next week. But until next time.